to introduce our moderator, Jamin London Tinsel. She is a Portland-based artist who received her MFA from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and a bachelor's degree in art education with an emphasis in sculpture from Colorado State University. Jamin was a founding member of the Hall Gallery, an artist-run studio gallery space in Portland from 1999 to 2007, and is currently the AP Art and Ceramics teacher at Grant High School here in Portland. Panelist Ann Goodrich is a ceramic sculptor and art teacher living in Portland, Oregon. Ann is represented by Guardino Gallery and recently was the K-12 artist in residence at Oregon College of Art and Craft. She's currently the ceramics and IB teacher at Sunset High School in Beaverton, Oregon. Panelist Andrew Butterfield is a Portland-based figurative sculptor and potter specializing in atmospheric firing. Andrew is an active member of the Portland ceramics community and teaches ceramics and AP art at Wilson High School. And at the end of the panel here, we have Lily Wendell. She's a painter and printmaker living and working in Portland, Oregon. Lily's teaching experience lies in visual studies design, drawing, painting, and printmaking in IB visual art curriculum. She's currently an art teacher at Lincoln High School. Please join me in welcoming this panel. Thanks so much, Dylan, for introducing us. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, it's really exciting to have Insika here in Portland this year um, and to get to be on this panel. Um, so I'm going to talk first about just why we're here. Um, we're artists. We're high school educators. Um, and we all really believe in the rigor that both the AP and the IB program bring to the high school curriculum. Uh, the four of us have worked uh, alongside each other for many years now, and developing this panel was really beneficial for us to learn about the similarities and the differences in our two programs. Andrew and I teach AP, and Lily and Ann teach IB. Um, the plan for our panel, panel plan, uh, Lily is going to give an overview of IB. And then Anne is kind of going to go into the IB process portfolio. Uh, Lily's then going to go back and talk about the IB comparative study and the exhibition. Then it'll pop over to me, and I'll give an overview of the AP 3D program, and I'll share a student portfolio example. And then Andrew will talk about the challenges of developing a new AP program in his high school. Uh, we just ask that you hold your questions. Um, we'll probably be about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll have about 20 or 25 minutes for lots of Q&A. Okay. Hello. 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 Um, so w one of the reasons why we decided to have this panel is um, both broad strokes, uh, understanding of these two college possible credit options in the high school level arts classroom. One program, AP, is often a little bit more familiar. It's been around in the United States a little bit longer. A lot of people have taken those classes. IB is a little bit more um, confusing to some as it is um, more of a holistic program versus individual classes. So it's important in explaining what IB art is, in explaining what IB's philosophy is, and that is more in a global study and viewing the um, curriculum as a uh, creating a well-rounded human who is able to see themselves uh, not just as their own um, myopic individual, but as a citizen of the planet. Um, in IB Art, um, it is um, uh, a um, program that is uh, developed in order for students to be on kind of their own path. It's inquiry-based. Um, meaning that the students lead themselves and uh, I'm, I'm much more of a facilitator and a coach um, helping them follow that, that path. Um, students uh, document a lot of their work through um, what is called a visual 
visual arts journal or visual journal, like a sketchbook, which then turns into a process portfolio. The um, <clears throat> work then is um, developed into studio work that is creating a show. So basically, you have um, a, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Our slides keep moving. Who's moving the slides? Can, can we have control over the slides? Okay. Okay. Um, so d basically, uh, um, in, in a very simplified terms, one of the main differences between the IB program and the AP program involves sort of a deeper uh, study and in, in personal inquiry as shown through a sketchbook. And that sketchbook is then um, collected and presented through a series of slides called the process portfolio. The three main um, parts, uh, I'm just going to, okay, um, the third slide, um, fourth slide, yeah. So the three main parts are um, your, your journey, if you will, your, your sketchbook as showing your journey. Um, and that's called the process portfolio, and that's 40%. And the exhibition, which is the art show of your studio work that's finished, and that's 40%. And then the comparative study, which is a critical analysis, um, and that's 20%. Um, and now Anne's going to talk sort of more in depth on this component that makes the IB art program special and different, um, which is the uh, process portfolio. So whether you're teaching IB or AP, the thing that's um, challenging about teaching students in an advanced program perfect, is you've got to transition them from, OK, we're all doing pinch pots and we're all turning them into beetles, to what do you want to say with your art? What medium what do you want to use? What style? What is your voice? So the process portfolio is this opportunity to guide students through discovering their voice. And as Lily said, it's mostly done through a sketchbook. Um, I personally spend the first month w doing what I call boot camps, exposing them to a different media every single day and to a different source of inspiration. Some of those inspirations come from me and some are generated by the students. And th these are two examples of uh, a student doing paper clay. Um, students are required to branch out of one category, so they have to do 2D, 3D, um, and digital. So you have an example here of a student using their sketchbook to outline what their digital process looks like. Um, beyond trying a, a variety of media, they need to show that they've sustained some technique with a singular um, media. IB does not, there's no such thing as IB ceramics. Students get to choose their media, and it, ceramics happens to be my passion, so I'm really excited when they do. But you can see that they get to um, bring in un unconventional materials. If a student wants to stick um, toothpicks into a banana peel, they absolutely have that right. They don't have to stick to any particular media. Um, I'll give them little research projects to, to kind of warm them up for their comparative study, and that's also included in their process portfolio. And some of those are very open-ended, and some of them are very specific research projects. But ultimately, students need to develop an awareness of who they're influenced by. So on the left, you see the professional work of Julie Alpert, um, a little writing that the student has done about that artist. And on the right, you see an example of the exhibition work of one of my um, students. So they need to be able to appropriate and be influenced by artists without directly copying them and speak to that influence. So their sketchbook is not just a visual journal. It's um, always supported by text and explanation of what they're thinking. So I, I tell them I should be able to crack open your spe uh, sketchbook and feel like I'm reading your mind. What is your thinking behind your artwork? We also use the process portfolio to, for students to demonstrate their problem solving. So a lot of times I'll require that they give a before and after um, picture of a critique. And, you know, maybe annotate why they made certain choices. <clears throat> and uh, IBR is very much a metacognitive program. So sometimes I'll ask them just to reflect on their own thinking. Do you prefer brainstorming through maquettes or drawings? 
Um, what did you get out of your critique? Um, and reflect on who they are as an artist. So in that process of kind of taking them from I'm telling you what to do to you figuring out who you are as an artist, um, this is a pretty transitional assignment for me. I call it finding your artistic DNA, which is something I stole from Twyla Tharp's book, The Creative Habit. So I'll give the students paradigms like order versus chaos, abstract versus realism. And then they go through and they have to kind of circle where they are on those continuums. Eventually they pick three of those words and make a, a work of art that exemplifies that. So if it's bold, abstract, and emotional, then they have to figure out how to embody that for themselves. The process portfolio is also um, assessed just on its basic quality of presentation. Is it legible? Are you using art vocabulary? And again, always supporting text with visuals and visuals with text. And finally, the, my final example here is just a nice slide of, um, let's see, can we advance? There we go. Um, what, a, what a nice slide might look like. Maybe they include a little illustration or um, a little bit of framing about around the images, but ultimately it has to be clear and legible and look good. And now we're back to Lily. Um, this is just an example page of a student whose um, work was primarily in uh, ceramics. So that's a, a finished uh, process portfolio page. It got kind of messed up in translation, but where's the forward button? I don't think it's recording. Okay. Just, you know, All right. So the exhibition is basically the art show. And um, how it is put together, um, we teach students um, in a two-year cycle or a three uh, or a one-year cycle, and um, the work produced depends on how long you are taking the course. And so, for students in a two-year program or higher level, really are ab able to develop a more cohesive body of work. Um, but all of the work is presented in a professional way, similar to you might see in a museum. So each artwork has what's called an exhibition text with it, and um, the whole show will have what's called a curatorial rationale um, with the show. And that is um, an artist statement um, type of text. Um, the uh, show, whoops. Next slide. Um, the show is, is judged, uh, uh, or the body of work is judged on coherence and connection of the works um, in, a, in a curatorial fashion that the students are following a theme or a thesis and are able to connect uh, works that they have um, done over, over time. And uh, technical competence doesn't mean that it, you're staying within one media, in fact, the one on the left is one slide. Okay, this is all one student's work, but that's not a finished um, slide of that student's work. Um, conceptual qualities and curatorial practice as how they are presenting the work in the show. Um, next, next slide. Um, this is a, an actual slide. So we submit the work to uh, the IB, IBO or IB organization via um, uh, digital images, JPEG images, and um, also with the, with the exhibition text with it. And this is one student's uh, artwork. Here's an example of another student's ceramic artwork. Often work is done in a series um, because especially uh, ceramics, you can have a lot of uh, time that you're working, an extended period of time that you're working on something, and so often it'll have other components that go with it. So the exhibition work is <coughs> the, the bulk of what the students are spending their time on. Um, okay, there's an, a newer version uh, of, uh, of what the IB curriculum is about, which is called the comparative study. And um, unfortunately, it becomes a little bit scary f sometimes for the full creative art student in that it's, it seems like it is a, um, a research paper. And it is 
a presentation um, in a PowerPoint uh, uh, way of showing a comparison of two artists and three artworks. And we teach methods of looking at and writing about artwork, looking at and um, processing formal qualities and um, conceptual qualities and um, making connections between uh, cultures and historical references, etc. cetera. Um, the second year kids or the kids who are in a two-year program are also required to create work that relates to the, the, the work that they're exploring. So um, uh, this is, uh, um, actually, can you go back? I'm sorry. Um, the, so the, on the bottom in blue, it says um, that the HL students need to make their own artwork um, connect somehow to the artwork that they're looking at for the comparative study. And then this is an example of a slide. These are uh, a comparison of two um, art artworks, and uh, the artist's names got deleted, but um, I believe that Fugio Yamori's artwork is in the Portland Art Museum. One of the parts of it is that you need to uh, experience the artwork in person, so it encourages students to have an experience with um, going to galleries and museums and looking at artwork. Um, go ahead and, and go forward one. Um, here's also a, a comparison. It doesn't mean that you need to have two of the same media even, so this is a student who's looking at an, an artist who's working in porcelain and another artist who is a painter. and. Um, I don't know. There was another slide that connected, but that's okay. All right. There. Okay. I'm up. So that was an overview of what goes on in the IB art program at the high school level. And now it's the Andrew and Jamin dance and song for you. And we're going to talk about AP. Um, I've been teaching AP for, I want to say, seven or eight years. And it's still a struggle. It sort of feels like... Um, 25 independent studies in one classroom. <laughs> and uh, so I'll just kind of talk about what AP is. Um, so it's a nationwide program um, called the College Board, offers um, college level curriculum. So, you know, AP Euro, AP, you know, English, AP Art History, lots of different courses. And um, based on student scores, they can receive college credit if that college um, accepts AP credit. And so what AP Studio is, is um, a portfolio building class. Um, you can, as an AP instructor, you can be um, pretty portfolio specific. So you might teach just AP 2D or AP drawing or AP 3D. And in my case, I teach all three um, under one class. So I have my 3D, 2D, and drawing students all together. Um, the portfolio is broken into three parts. There's the quality section, the breadth, and the concentration. Um, and could you go to the next slide? So uh, the quality section of the portfolio um, is really just looking at all of the students' work and finding the five pieces that are really their um, strongest. There are five pieces throughout the entire portfolio. and that. Um, the nice thing about the 3D portfolio is that it's all digital, whereas my 2D and drawing students actually have to submit actual works. So it's all digital. Um, the quality can come from breadth, can come from concentration. Um, and then the breadth section is a sort of a bigger chunk of the portfolio. It's eight pieces of work um, that should show a, a demonstration of the understanding of um, elements and principles of design in 3D. Um, the works don't have to be clay. It can be sort of anything within the 3D realm. I notice my uh, 3D students, I sort of either have clay kids or I have 3D non-clay kids, and they, it's, a, it's hard to get them to kind of bridge that. Um, can we go to the next slide? And then I want to talk about the concentration. So my breadth section of the portfolio, I try to have those students 
um, coming in, especially if they're coming in on a testing year, like they, they want to come into that class and they want to submit their portfolio that year, that they're actually done their breath work when they walk into my door. And so the way that happens is when students forecast, I have meetings with them before the school year even ends, and I look at all of their work, and we decide what pieces could go in the breadth, what pieces should be eliminated, and how much summer work they have to do, so that when we, they walk in the door, they're sort of ready to move into concentration. If they're coming in as a junior, and they don't want to test their junior year and just want to keep developing the portfolio, uh, we work on, you know, work to do over the summer and um, developing the breadth more, but we really spend that junior year just kind of developing more work, more process, and then they come back uh, a senior year to, to develop the concentration more. So concentration is a sustained investigation. It's 12 images that are submitted, um, generally for 3D students. That might be five pieces. That might be 12 pieces. It sort of depends on the complexity of the work, if they want to show some process <coughs> images to go with it. Um, the AP uh, portfolio is, is a lot different than the IB portfolio, where um, there isn't, from what I've understood, uh, there's some sense of rigidity sometimes in the IB where there's like pretty specific things that students need to show. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. There's specific criteria, yeah. Yeah. Whereas in the AP portfolio, uh, you know, quality, breadth, concentration, and uh, it's, it, it feels like there's a little bit more room um, to move. Uh, there are links of AP Studio 3D design portfolios that you can see on the College Board website. Uh, the College Board website is a great resource for looking at um, any AP works. Uh, could we see the breadth slide? So I'm gonna just show one student's breadth pretty quickly. So the breadth um, shows uh, demonstrating a range of conceptual and technical approaches. This first image is uh, four different students, and then I'm gonna show the next eight slides is one student's entire breadth portfolio. Can we see the next slide? Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is a student. I, I put the score on here. How many of you are uh, IB or AP instructors right now? Wow. Woo! Awesome. That's great. So uh, you may know um, about the scoring. We're not going to get into the scoring so much uh, because it's a really complex part of it. Uh, oh, is it working? It's working. Okay, great. Um, so this was a score of five, which is a, a high score. Um, and this is the student's breath work. This student made the works, actually some in when um, Andrew was a middle school instructor. So some of her pieces, this one, um, was part of her eighth grade body of work. So she gathered work all the way from middle school up to her junior year, because she was a tester. She chose some pieces uh, from her concentration that didn't actually fit well with the concentration, and she moved those into the breadth, took out some older, not as successful breadth pieces. And she also uh, worked with a studio artist at a pottery studio, um, developing more works outside of the classroom. I'm gonna show her concentration as well. Um, the fourth part of the AP portfolio is the statement. Um, back when I first started, I focused so much on the statement. I had students write and rewrite and write and rewrite, and then I started talking to some of the AP readers. Have any of you been an AP reader? One person. So one thing I found out was that the, um, the readers don't spend a lot of time looking at statements. They don't have a lot of time. They have three minutes kind of per section of portfolio they look at. And now it's an emphasis. I definitely think it's a really essential part, but we don't spend as much time on this because it's really about the work. Um, so this is her concentration statement, focuses on tr transformation, exploring different phases and changes in uh, life, life cycles. She made uh, seven works. One thing that we find uh, when students are working in concentration is that um, they will make pieces and then end up really changing the order as they go. So her uh, 
one of her last pieces ended up being a first piece because it wasn't really as strong because she was rushing at the end to get it done. Uh, she also found that um, she was able to pull earlier breath works that she didn't use in the breath portfolio as early pieces in the concentration as her kind of concept or idea was already beginning in the, um, as she was exploring the breath. And then this was uh, her final piece. So I'm going to turn it over to Andrew to talk about his experiences as a uh, teaching new AP program at Wilson High School. Hello. Um, so I, I just, I, I'd like to think about it, things through the student's point of view, how they're looking at it. And when I have my students come to me after they forecast as a junior and say they want to do it, we get started on it like right away. Just, all right, let's start on thinking about just what, what is the idea of a concentration? What would you want to develop and change in yourself as an artist and get better at? Um, they kind of hone down a little bit about what they're going to do and get started like this month working towards the end of the year, creating their first concentration piece, um, thinking about what it is that they're going to grow on and change. Um, and they get released from doing the, the assignments of the advanced fourth quarter student and get started in on their concentration. Um, last year, I had them doing the breadth over the summer and assigned them some homework. And what I notice about homework and kids in general is that they just don't do a really great job on homework, ever. Um, and so when it, the end of the summer came, it was very apparent that the last day before summer was over, they ripped through three projects as fast as they could to bring in, and they looked it. Um, so I'm, I'm moving towards a little different approach. I'm going to have them create a couple pieces between now and the end of the school year. I'm going to have a workshop in the summer where we get together and we make a bunch of pieces, fill up a kiln, fire it off. And then later in the summer, get together, get those same pieces out, and do a raku firing, just because it like pushes them into a different realm of how to process the the piece and finish it. Um, when they come back in the fall, it's like all about making concentrations. Um, the picture I'm showing here is um, a few pieces from one of my students, uh, Riley, and. She chose she wanted to do wheel work and improve her ability to make sets <coughs> of cups and vessels um, and really working at understanding the glazing and how the glazing improves. And so from beginning to the end piece, they, the piece has got a lot stronger. Um, they've really improved on her, she's improved on her ability to trim and that's one of the things that uh, the craft of the process happens. You start improving craft by producing a lot. So each concentration had about four different pieces in it, four cups, a pitcher and three cups or something like that. And she did 12 concentrations. So she has a lot to choose from. She's made a lot of work. Um, they do about one concentration every two weeks from the beginning of the school year up until um, the end of February, then we've been putting together a bunch more um, pieces that are going to go towards the breadth and make sure they have all their stuff together. Um, another student, Genevieve, her concentration was dragons. She just loves dragons. And um, in some senses, I think about it, a dragon as being kind of cliche in a high school setting. They really love it. But if they start in on that, one idea, even though it might be her first one was a little bit weak, they start getting better and better. That dragon in the upper right-hand corner was 27 inches tall. I had to take out the shelf and uh, squeeze it in. And we actually had to wait it a few, uh, about a week and a half extra for it to totally get its maximum shrink so we could get the lid closed. Um, <laughs> but she was really excited about it. She researched glazing on it by doing a lot of test tiles, a lot of sampling of the different glazes to come up with glazes that would 
really sh like blend together and pull out the most dragon-like effects. Um, so I find like uh, my students, it, it is a very individualized thing. I'm coming and meeting with each student on their own, talking about them, about their concentration and where they're going with it and keeping them being fresh and thinking about what they're, where they're going with it, basically. Um, and so it, it requires a bit of extra work in that there's, there's not, in my class I have AP and advanced students going at the same time and so I've got this little cohort of independent study students doing all sorts of cool stuff but it infects the rest of the group. They're, just, they're totally into seeing these crazy new projects that the AP students are coming up with. So that's about what I've been doing. Um, what were you doing next? Um, one of the things I want to just add that I forgot to mention is um, in the AP concentration portfolio, one of the things we're really trying to get students to um, do is show growth and transformation. You know, see how the, the beginning of an idea can really bloom by the time they hit that last piece. And, um, and that's one thing that I think is really exciting about teaching that program is seeing that kids sort of have those aha moments with their work and sort of pushing them in new directions and all of that. So um, this is just a slide kind of showing what, um, like in a nutshell, IB, AP, and kind of what both of them are. So IB being inquiry-based, um, including the comparative study, research essay, um, both of them having a portfolio and both portfolios are digitally submitted. Um, both have an assessment looking at voice, technical success in the work, and potential for college credit. Um, and advanced placement, um, it's a lot about quantity. I mean, those students, in the end, need around 16 to 18 pieces um, of work. So, and it's one of the things that is a struggle, too, is that for some students coming in, they think it's a, you know, a bowl. Like, oh, I got a bowl, but really I, I want to see four bowls. I want to see a nesting set of bowls. I want to see, a, you know, a pitcher and four cups as one concentration piece, and that's a challenge. Um, and then, like we said, 12 images for concentration. Um, so we're up at about 35 minutes or so, and we have around 20, 25 minutes for questions. Um, before we go to questions, I'm just going to ask if any IB teachers have anything else they want to share. Yeah, I think um, probably the biggest difference between AP and IB is illustrated in Andrew's talking about how a student did all those test tiles before she glazed the dragon. That student gets credit for that in the sense that she chose the best glaze for her artwork, and that's how it's, it's seen. But an IB student would take photographs of all those test tiles. They would write down their recipes. They would document all that. And so they're kind of getting credit for the process part behind it. And, um, and actually, the um, emphasis isn't always on, um, although in the visual arts, you have an actual show, and that now you have to actually take photographs of the exhibition. You show the work, you put it up, and, and that um, is a part of it. But also, um, that the, in the IB philosophy, there is always this back component of the, um, the journey um, versus the end result. And so like, it's not necessarily about like, amazing work on one level. Um, that it is really um, that technical competence and, and high level of, of uh, uh, conceptual qualities are a, are, a, are a graded component, but they're not the only component. And, and Anna has talked a lot about the process portfolio and to just emphasize the word process, that a lot of these kids, um, <clears throat> you know, they're full IB students, meaning they're taking, you know, two years of full college immersion style courses and and um, that a lot of it is about you know that this is the journey I've gone on and and here is like all of the components of that um, in the in the Q and A we thought to have sort of th a couple of, of um, you know pointed questions um, the the philosophy question in ceramics or in clay uh, uh, about you know the pound of clay versus the perfect pot. I don't know if people are familiar with that um, adage or story, 
but um, the idea that um, quantity and, and practice and physical practice with your hands, especially in a, in a discipline like using clay and ceramics, is incredibly valuable, um, but not always 100% practical in a high school setting, and, and so that that can become challenging, and so sort of open, open that Open that question. <laughs> I'm going to open that question. Yeah, there's, there's a, a microphone right there. I'm not going to go with that question, so I apologize. That's great. Um, You're fired. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> Let me get back here. Um, we have a 3D sculpture teacher and a ceramics one at our high school. As long as one of them picks up the AP, that's covered because the student could go to either or to get the work that they need for their portfolio, correct? No need for two AP teachers in the 3D area. Um, say the first part again. We have a, a, a 3D sculpture high school teacher and a ceramics and a ceramics teacher. Okay. We don't need each one of them teaching that. It's just one. Probably because they can not. Just bounce. Because it's a 3D design portfolio, and so I would just say seeking out one of them that's willing to take it on. Uh huh. Um, yeah. And the student, for example, if if I have a ceramics student that wants to do AP, and I'm not teaching AP, but the 3D sculpture teacher is. I can guide them through their work, but the other teacher would have to wrap up all the stuff the, for the, it to turn it the in. The technical right. stuff, yeah. yeah. Sounds yeah. good, thank you. Who else? Sure. So I teach AP ceramics, and um, we actually have both. She's leaving, but we have, at my school, we have an AP sculpture teacher. And Did you hear that? AP, we have AP sculpture and AP ceramics at my school. Um, and one thing that is really nice about it is that I teach AP ceramics, and um, the ceramics class is, wheel, is very wheel-based. I mean, I do have sculptors, but I have a, it's a very heavy wheel-based class. And so my AP ceramics is very wheel... It's, they start with the wheel, and then they alter on top of that. Whereas the sculpture teacher does plaster and resin and found objects, and so it's a very different pieces come out of that. So there is pros and cons to both, I think. I think it's, for our program, it's really great that we both exist separately and do AP separately. But I think you could, if it's like a funding issue, because you don't want both of them to do AP, you could have it d together. But for us, it works really well to do it separately. It's probably the numbers, too. Yeah. Numbers of students, they can get more Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we like have like eight AP ceramic students and five AP sculpture students. So it's smaller. They're small little classes, but it's a private school, so makes a difference. <laughs> um, sorry, I just wanted That's to. That's OK. No, that was great. So one thing that I really struggle with is um, I feel like the concentration piece is this really organic, like you said, you're a facilitator. I am a facilitator when I work with my kids on concentration. Um, <laughs> to get strong breadth pieces, I, I struggle with it more because um, I want them to have that growth. And I want them to see in the portfolio. I want. The, I want them to have a lot of different ideas and a lot of different approaches. But I, I don't like assigning seniors and juniors projects. It's just not the way that I teach. It's not, I, it feels closed to me and they're not expressing themselves enough and they're not getting to do enough what they're interested in. So to get that growth in the breadth without assigning, I want you to do bottles or you know, I want you to do altered pieces or something. I just do you guys have open ended questions that you ask your kids for the breadth and sort of to get them thinking about that growth? Do you have them um, sort of look at pieces? Because sometimes my kids put stuff that they'll make freshman and sophomore year in a breadth, but most of the time it's only the stuff that they make when they're juniors and seniors. So sure. what what I found this this semester is we've I uh, cut them off on their concentration. I said, all right, you're done. You did it. You got everything great there, but you need your breadth stuff. Break out of the box. Go and do some other type of projects. You've been on the wheel for the last eight months. Build something by hand. Make a slab. Do something. Right. And I do breadth usually totally before, like but maybe dived I into it, it. And they're, they're loving that because now they can, they're not constrained by, by their own constraints. Yeah. So you start with concentration, then you do breath. I do it more like you said, where, it's, where they start their breath their junior year and finish at the beginning of the senior year. Yeah. And, and then in like November, we start concentration. And so the, the, the wheel throwers who've developed some really awesome skills on the wheel and were afraid of hand building like right. last year at this time, they sit down to hand build and they're a little nervous at first, but they find that 
wow, I've got all these skills with clay that I didn't have a year ago. Yeah. And the breadth pieces are a lot stronger than they were on the homework pieces that they sloughed through and they were afraid of and didn't do as great. So, so one of the things I do, um, and uh, you had mentioned that um, in the first part of the year, you sort of flood students with all of these brainstorming, um, experimentations, risk-taking assignments. And that's kind of what I do too. So. First, I meet with them before the school year ends, ask to look at everything, kind of look at what they could use, what they can't use, um, what they might need to work on. And I give them this summer homework packet. And it's, it's sort of to scare them out of taking the class a little bit. <laughs> because we have probably 40 students that forecast for it. And I want the class to be around 20, if yeah. maybe smaller. So, um, and... So they go home with the summer packet. There's a lot of breadth ideas in it. Like I have a 2D breadth idea sheet, a 3D, a drawing. Um, I circle some things that I'll say, oh, you already have this, this, and this. What about, have you done any figurative sculpture? Have you done this? So that's part one. Part two is kind of what Ann does, where the first quarter, I have two assignments that are very process driven to get them really taking some risks. And it's harder for my 3D students in the class because one is called this research sketchbook. And a lot of my 2D students do that with paper and cardboard and things like that. And with my 3D students, I say, you know, don't think about the sketchbook as a as this traditional form. It can, I, this year I had a student make a clay sketchbook. Um, I've had other students that make things that it's like a big box and then inside it each part and piece comes out showing each technique that they experiment with. So they take that, um, that sketchbook and that they can usually pull two to three pieces from the sketchbook. And then the second we, thing we do um, is a it's called art cards, and it's like a mini concentration to get them thinking about that. And my 3D students will make them, you know, this big, these mini pieces, and usually they have three to five pretty interesting ones. Hmm. So we pull from that too. Okay. Do you guys have anything yeah. to add? So, I mean, it's the exhibition is the same thing as the concentration. Um, so as Jamin said, I do that boot camp. The first month, a different project every day. And those are not finished projects, which can, which can kind of feel like a waste, but it's turned out to be a great way to expose them to lots of different techniques, lots of different ideas, and then they can choose to come back to some or all of those or to combine them, and it gives them just this base that they can choose from. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So um, we, three of us teach in Portland Public Schools, and so we're on the same schedule. Um, we, we're on an A-B block. Um, most days are 90 minutes, and then on our flex days, it's a 76, is that right? Yeah, about that. Yeah. And, then and mine's an every other day, 90 minute. Yeah. Uh, I teach uh, AP in Atlanta, and uh, we're on a 50 minute blo or to schedule every day, seven period wow. day. Um, do you guys, I don't know if anybody is experiencing this, but I'm, I'm really struggling with it this year. And that's the, this kind of culture of mediocrity that we've got going on with the kids, that they take like five and six AP classes and they don't have any time for the studio. So they're just completely overworked, overwhelmed. Yeah. They play their cross, they run. And then I, I really struggle with them to produce quality work in the 50 minute session. And I want to know if you guys have any strategies for that. And, and finishing work, because you know, they'll, they'll be really committed and they'll be in the studio working, but they're just not producing at the rate that they need to produce. Um, I've, per I've tried to create a lot of time for students to be able to deal with that, with um, getting more studio time. I've created a clay club after school. The, the AP student who's on track and in, in special training and can't ever come after school. Um, I, in our school district, there are a lot of seniors that have empty periods. And I said, well, you should be my TA then. And I'll give you a little like TA work now and then, but I'll use it for doing more that extra time. Get an extra, you know, in your situation, an extra 50 minutes a day would do a lot for them. Yeah. Um, if your school doesn't have that, I've uh, had students who come in before school, you know, do the, the little process of, oh, it's gotta be unwrapped, it's got, this thing needs to be added on, so that then later in the day they're able to get back to it and it's dried out enough to work on. Um, so yeah, getting that extra time is really important. And uh, how do you do it? 
Um, a couple ways. First, that threatening before the school year ends. I have <laughs> current AP students stand up in that big meeting and talk about how many hours they put in. And we talk about like this, you shouldn't take this class if you're on constitution team or if you're, you know, in the, the we have this really intense like nationally acclaimed choir. If you're doing these other things, this might not be the right class for you. So we do that. The other thing, um, I talk about is making a mini studio in your home. Um, it doesn't necessarily work for my wheel throwers, although one student bought a wheel this year and stuck it in his bedroom, which is carpeted. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> it's like, oops. Um, so that's, you know, and a lot of open studio time um, and yeah, taking, taking work home, making a studio. How about you guys? I would come at it from like a totally opposite approach. In our school, we are, you know, equity up and down. And, um, you know, what would happen if a student doesn't pass? Does that impact your job or your, your how you are doing? For us, in our world, in the IB grades, by the time the IB grades come out, no one cares. <laughs> no one cares about us either. S sad truth. But I mean, there aren't that many schools that actually accept the credit. And when they do, it's general credit. So I'm not selling it as a way to like, you know, this is a bargain and you can get out of taking, um, you know, college class. I'm, I'm, you know, trying to convince a, a kid that this is an awesome experience that you will totally jive and benefit from getting into. If you're not into it and you're just kind of skating along and doing the absolute minimum, that's what you're going to get out of it. But that's okay because sometimes just that bit is going to maybe like later they're going to be like, wow, that was the best class I ever took and I'm going to come back to it. So, you know, I, we don't do, uh, we're not allowed to do any gatekeeping. Um, you know, we can't necessarily prevent kids from taking the class, and we certainly can't tell kids ahead of time, like, it looks like you're going to fail, so you should drop the class. I mean, I can't yeah. do any of that. Um, if a kid doesn't want to take it, that's fine, but I'm actually on the end of, I have been told I need to encourage more kids mm -hmm. who are not full art kids to get engaged in IB visual art. And we've gone from, you know, I had a group of four testing. I've been teaching IB for 13 years and we've gone from like four kids testing and this year I have uh, 12 students testing and, uh, and uh, nine who are juniors to, to be set for a I, uh, HL next year. So this is a totally different approach, and maybe that wasn't what you wanted to hear, but. No, it's good to hear. I, I taught at an IB school, too, for a little while, so I kind of seen, I, I, I didn't teach IB, but I saw that, and we taught M MYP and all that, you know, to the standard, and so I've seen it go. And we're required to, um, to, the kids are required, we're a magnet school, so they have to take an AP. They finish with that to get mm -hmm. the magnet seal. So, anyway, but I appreciate it. It's all a That's bunch of good advice. You. Maybe this will be fast, and I apologize if you covered it at the beginning. But my question is concerning documentation. I don't teach an AP class, but I would like to. But I, sp I feel like I spend about three to four weeks around scholastics, documenting and then altering images in Photoshop to crop. Make the students do it. So then, yes. So then the question is, they're so used to using their iPhones. That's fine. That's fine. The quality mm -hmm. transfer is fine. Do you require them to do the Photoshop manipulation or no? If they can crop it. I teach it. them Photoshop minimal, just adjusting the histogram, but I, you can also do it in preview. Okay. So and that's fine. The that's quality fine. seems to be okay. They're more tech savvy than we are. They, they can handle and it. And I do feel like I end up teaching what's equivalent to then a photo class if yeah. I try to teach them the old school yeah. the with more a digital the camera. The more smartphones have be, uh, developed, the less and less I do of that. I used to do a lot more. And it's all on their own awesome. time? Well, they can use class time to do that, but it's up to them. Yeah, OK. It's helpful to have just a space. Right, OK. All right, thank you. Sure. Hi. I used to take all the photos for my kids too for IB and then it's I don't at all anymore. They have to do everything. So it's good taking the workload way down. I, you just mentioned a book, Twyla Thorpe, and I don't know what it is. So can you just tell me? So Twyla Thorpe is a choreographer and she just beautifully breaks down the creative process in her book, uh, The Creative Habit. Um, and she, she gives some exercises that you can do to develop your creativity, but she just kind of talks about like one example is um, 
what's your view? Do you like to look at things close up, like mic at a microscopic level, or do you like grand vistas? And so there's just a lot of questioning, which is so very much aligned with the IB inquiry model, um, as well as just like practical things to do. Like if you're a 3D person, maybe you don't need a sketchbook, maybe you need a box, and you need to put like the seed pods that you've been collecting in the box, and you have all your reference there, things like that. Thank you. Before, um, if anyone is, I, I have a handout if anyone wants more information on IB. It's just a double-sided sheet. And it's on the table back with um, Robert, who's holding it up right there. Hi. So the one thing that I've kind of run against is this whole push for rigor versus retention. So versus, to, versus what? Retention. Retention. So uh, the more projects that I've done and the more I've pushed kids to try to and mic? do more and more and more, the less they're actually like producing quality and retaining their ideas from one project to the next. What are some of the tricks that you use to, with the more speed and more rigor, to retain that retention time? That's a great question. Does anyone have a thought? Well, I mean, I think that question speaks to the difference between AP and IB, that the AP program is very much quantity-based. Um, and the IB program is, is meant to be a little deeper, like you dig deeper for each piece rather than fast and speed. Um, I think the, the question of pacing is, is a balancing act that every teacher kind of struggles with. Um, and from year to year, it really depends on my students. Like, are we going to, is this assignment going to take two weeks or three weeks? And sometimes if you give them too much time, the quality goes down because they want to, like, do their math homework in art class or whatever. So I don't, I guess I don't have a, a pure answer for that. I would just encourage you to experiment with it. I, I think that uh, there is a part of the reflection where students really have to be addressing on their own their own process of refinement and and like when you've gotten to this point where you know you're looking at it and it's you know mediocre and you're giving feedback to the kiddo maybe you are re-questioning them like what more could happen here you know what are surface qualities that could be addressed or you know what could this be a performance piece or you know could it what could it look like in a different framework so i mean throwing those questions back to the kids i think helps them and they have to record it and I think the kids help each other with that during critiques, too. I guess the one piece that I would say is um, because I, I like to think of that, um, that AP year so much about concentration that I feel like we create a lot of space for making that body of work because the hope is that all that breath stuff they've done beforehand, all that, you know, they've been in my class for maybe two years, intro ceramics, intermediate advanced ceramics. They've made four strong pieces the first year. They've made four strong pieces the second year. And then we have the space to really explore the, that part of the portfolio. And that's another difference between the two programs. I can't require that my students have prerequisites. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi, um, I'm fortunate uh, right now I teach three levels of ceramics, beginning, intermediate, and advanced, and then we're considering. The I teach three levels of ceramics right now, beginning, intermediate, advanced. Those are each a year long class, and then it seems like it could be a natural fit for the fourth year to be AP. However, <laughs> uh, knowing that kids are kids and our school is very academically rigorous, we offer probably 15 other AP tests. The studio is the time at which they are not doing all of the other types of things. Knowing that AP is not always a guarantee for college credit and it involves a significant amount of involvement on both my part and their part, there is a, I see there being somewhat of a risk of bringing AP in uh, that it then can potentially overwork the student and maybe limit some of the risks and freedom and play that happens in the studio that is what makes ceramics different from every other class they take. So could you talk about, from the student perspective, the difference between taking like a second year of advanced or taking AP and how that fits in with all of the other coursework that they're taking, knowing that an AP student in art is likely also taking other AP classes? Sure, great question. Anybody have mm -hmm. any thoughts? 
Well, when um, I, I think of the, the AP as the third year, so I wouldn't say do it as a fourth year. I would just say, okay, you can choose to do third year advanced, which is you're assigning projects, or more an independent thing, which is AP, and you're, the student is individually deciding what their scope is and where their focus is. Um, I, I, think that, I think that balancing it with the other AP classes that they're taking, the thing about the AP 3D is that it, it is in the studio. It's still a studio class. Um, they're going to have to figure out how to get a little bit extra time doing studio work, whether that's making a mini lab at home or coming in before school or after school or lunch or something like that. Um, but I, I, I don't think that it, it's, it's the same as the other AP classes they're taking, which are very homework-based and very strong and intensive. Um, this is intensive in their, in their brain and in their development of craft, but um, it's different than the, your advanced class where the class is going through assignments, maybe. Well, so our, by the time they get to advance, we're already using, essentially, I'm meeting with them individually. They determine what their assignments are, and then I kind of hold them accountable for it. So they determine their curriculum in advance. And so AP would put a structure to that as far as the quantity that they're going to be doing. And it wouldn't be too much different than what you're probably already doing. And I just want to say, for either program, just because it's advanced and, yes, there are deadlines and things you have to upload and everything, it doesn't mean you should lose that sense of discovery or play. So about four pieces into my kiddo's exhibition work, I give them a risk-taking assignment, and they have to literally burn their work or scratch it up or let somebody else draw on it, things like that. Hi, um, I'm from a charter school in Delano, California. We don't offer currently any AP or IB classes. Um, instead, they offer um, actual community level, community college level courses at our school. Um, what would you recommend for me to do if I wanted to start an AB uh, course? That's a great question. Um, so I would say, f you know, from where I was coming from, my school offered AP. Um, but we didn't have AP Art Studio. The, um, the highest class was this sort of art seminar, and a few students would test, but it was very low-key, and it wasn't really a class. Um, so, but we had AP as a structure in our school. Um, mm -hmm. So I would start with your curriculum VP or um, somebody in your counseling office that works on curriculum development and t talk about your interest in it if they're... Um, willing to you know maybe they'll send you to the AP Institute to get and I, I actually should make this point and I don't know if this is the case for IB but you don't actually have to go to the AP Institute and get licensed as an AP instructor to um, offer AP I did because I wanted to learn about the ins and outs of the program um, it was a great week I spent a week in Bellevue Washington with all these other new AP art teachers um, you develop your syllabus, you know, you just get all this time to sort of work on that. So to, it seems like starting with your curriculum um, folks in counseling and then moving from there. Does anyone else have for IB? IB, you're not going to offer as a singleton. It's, it's in an IB school. It's a fo philosophical approach. It's, but that said, you don't technically need to have the um, training before you are having kiddos test. It's harder. It's a lot more fly by the seat of your pants, but um, there are sort of scaffolding and, and websites and people that you can contact for support. So, but you can't start from, you can't just offer an IB art class in a non IB art. So, you, you have school. to, like, your whole school has to be like IB? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank and, you. And feel free to stay and keep asking questions, but just so you guys know, it's your lunchtime. So, <laughs> thanks so much for coming.